95.5 is WXMG Lancaster, a radio one station, live from the Jack Maxton studio. It's time for some straight talk. You're listening to Straight Talk Live with Kahari and Haro during the community talk block on Magic 95.5. Hello, family. Hello, family. Black America is the number one black colleges. And you are listening to Great Talk Live with Brother Kahari on 95.5. All right, all right. We are we are where we are. Lord have mercy. You ought to be up in here this morning. But you can be. Go to MyColumbusMagic.com. Watch us on Facebook Live. You'll see all these beautiful, beautiful women. And you'll see all these ugly dudes up in here, with the exception of me. But, <laughs> but anyway, seriously, uh, we have got quite a, a, a compliment. Uh, Dr. Umar Johnson is going to join the discussion. He's coming to town uh, I believe it's October the 21st, and uh, uh, hopefully we can have him here. But he's going to tell you that uh, when he joins us at 830. And I'm going to ask him the question also, is there a war against masculinity, more specifically black masculinity? All right, it's time for Dr. Umar Johnson. I believe we got him here, so we're waiting on him. Dr. Umar is coming to town on October the 21st, and uh, you've got to be there. This is a world-famous scholar, lecturer, I mean nationalist, brother that's been all over the world, millions of hits on YouTube and everywhere else. This is the great Dr. Umar Johnson, a young dynamo. Good morning, my young brother. How are you? Did we lose him? Okay, there he is. He, he, did we get him again? All that great introduction. All right, doctor, you there? Yes, I am. <laughs> How you doing this morning? All is well, my brother. All is well here in Philadelphia. Uh, I'll be speaking in Trenton, New Jersey uh, this afternoon, which is actually the city where I earned my pre-doctoral internship. So looking forward to Trenton, and then after that, I'll be making my way on up to Columbus, Ohio. I guess we have just a week now, Saturday coming, I'll be there. So I'm looking forward to it. It'll be okay, tell everybody where you're going to be at and what time. I will be at the first AME Zion Church in Columbus, Ohio, this coming Saturday. That's on Bryden Road, yes. October 21st, yes, sir, 4 o'clock. The doors open up at 2 o'clock. All children, 17 and under, are free, all elders 65 and older are also free. All right, so that's going to be great. Uh, Dr. Umar has lectured on many topics. Dr. Umar, what we are dealing with this morning, and, and, and let's see if we, you know, people want to ask you questions, we'll open up the line. Don't forget Dr. Umar is at First AME Zion uh, Church. Uh, that's on Bryden Road. We do the uh, King Breakfast there. Am I right, Tyrone? every year so dr umar is coming doors open at two o'clock he starts the lecture at four you don't want to miss the great dr umar johnson uh, uh coming this saturday october the 21st dr umar we were uh, my show has been looking at this whole question surrounding the boy scouts admitting girls etc cetera, etc cetera. and we asked the question is this the latest salvo the latest war against the whole question of masculinity in particular black masculinity so i put out the question is there a war against black masculinity dr umar can we get your thoughts on it uh, certainly the quick answer is yes and to provide context for that answer we have to be very clear that the number one enemy to white supremacy, the number one threat to white supremacy, and the most hated individual within white supremacist logic and philosophy is the unapologetic African alpha male. If you look, the entire history of black people in America has been a history that has sought to exterminate the unapologetic African alpha male as a means of controlling and patrolling the black community as a whole. So when you look at the Marcus Garvey, the Nat Turner, the Malcolm X, it has always been about killing the alpha male. When you look at incarceration as someone who does a lot of work pro bono in the prison system, nearly all prisoners, for the most part, are alpha males. When you look at the brothers who are allowed to succeed in American society, especially since the turn of the 21st century, Y2K, we have increasingly seen a rise in the effeminate prototype of a black male. Working in the school system, many of the new teachers are black males effeminized. In politics, many of the modern politicians effeminized. Many of the modern preachers effeminized. Many of the black men in the media, very effeminate. And so we've gotten to a point now 
where America has sent out a strong and very clear message to black men that if you want to be successful within mainstream America, you must adopt a non-threatening, docile, beta male, effeminate personality. All right. We've got a lot of guests in the studio. Uh, let me open it up. They may have questions about this that they, they want to address. And you can call in and doc, talk to Dr. Umar Johnson. He's coming to town Saturday, October the 21st at the first AME Zion on Bryden Road. And uh, Tyrone, what's that exact address on Bryden? That's going to be 876 Bryden Road, which is the corner of Bryden and 18th. There's a big, beautiful church there. You cannot miss it. And this is exciting, exciting next Saturday with Dr. Umar coming to Columbus. He's going to open the doors at 2 o'clock. Lecture begins at 4. You don't want to miss it. Go ahead, my brother. Yes, Go Dr. ahead, Brother Umar, Kenny. I do have a question for you. Uh, the FBI is pegging that African-American alpha male types, activists like myself and my brother Carlos here, are a threat to society because we take a stand. Uh, in the future, they're going to be locking us out for some of our speech and some of our actions, calling us terrorists. What do you think about that? And I'm sure you heard that. Oh, yes, indeed. I was in Paris speaking last week when I got the information that the FBI has a new terrorist uh, term known as black identity extremists. And this is unprecedented because it hasn't been until this new black identity extremism that the FBI has defined that identifying with your race of origin, your history and your culture is an act of terrorism. I'm not aware of any group of people on earth who have ever been considered to be terrorists just because they're proud to be who they are. So that clearly speaks to the fact that America is not comfortable with African people in America identifying with our brothers and sisters in Africa, which makes a lot of sense because even the big new Brzezinski of Barack Obama's mentor who uh, created the Trilateral Commission for the Rockefeller family, he even said that the greatest threat to white supremacy was the operational unity of Africans in America and Africans in Africa. So clearly the Pan-Africanist is the threat. And the Pan-Africanist is the only threat. America has never been scared of anything else except that international unification of African people. Go ahead. Dr. Umar, would you define what what unity would look like if black men uh, came together and, 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 and focused on changing our, our, our problems, fixing, our, fixing black problems? Well, I think that the unity has to be operational. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be unconditional because I don't believe there's unconditional unity anywhere on earth. Even when the white man works together, the Chinese man, the Arab, the East Indian, they, they unify around purpose. And I think black men have to get into the mindset where we unify around purpose. I think one of the reasons we stay disunified is because we want to unify around religion and we want to unify around political ideology. As far as I'm concerned, that's a recipe for disaster because we are too diverse religiously and we are too diverse politically to try to bring everybody under one umbrella. I think one of the reasons that the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey was so successful, who probably was the greatest unifier of black people, without question the greatest organizer in modern history, was because he did not try to organize on a religious basis. Every other leader of uh, post emancipation sought to bring us together around a religion. Most of them either wanted to give us Islam or they wanted to give us Christianity. Garvey didn't do either. Garvey organized us around African identity, and I think that's why he'll always be probably the greatest organizer in modern history. We have to come together around purpose, the purpose of building a bank, the purpose of defending the community, the purpose of empowering our single black mothers who are raising these boys, the purpose of building a supermarket. If we keep it focused on purpose, then the meeting and the initiative can never uh, degenerate to an argument. It can never uh, degenerate to an ideological contest of wills. Keep it focused on purpose so everyone can, uh, can be clear that it's all about the action. You're listening to the voice of Dr. Umar Johnson, who's coming to town this Saturday, October the 21st. He's coming to uh, First AME Zion at 876 Bryden Road, and the doors open at 2 o'clock. His lecture begins at 4. Dr. Umar, what is your message to single black women who are responsible right now for raising young black males in terms of how they can, what they need to do to make sure that they remain men, that they grow to be men? Dr. Umar. Yes, sir. Three points on that. The first one is I need mothers to understand that they can never be fathers. No matter how good of a job they do, they can never be fathers. One of the narratives in the black community, which I think is a very dysfunctional narrative that we have now, 
where we believe that single-parent homes are sufficient. Single-parent homes may be necessary, given the war against black boys, but they are never sufficient. Psychologically speaking, a child who comes from a healthy single-parent home is never as psychologically best as a parent, as a child who comes from a two-parented home. So we need mothers to be clear of that, because I, I see a lot of women who say that they're the mother and the father. You're never the father. You are absolutely never the father. So we need women to understand that, because when you think that you're the father, sometimes you might consider the, the real biological father to be unnecessary. And this is a big problem, because I'm seeing in the black community a crisis of single black mothers keeping the biological fathers out of the children's lives for personal selfish reasons. We have this narrative that fathers are abandoning their children. I do not find that narrative to be true in most cases. I would say it's true in a minority of cases, but for the most part, the sisters are being dishonest with the community. It's not the father who chose to leave the child. It's the mother who chose to keep the father out, i.e. she wanted to be with him and he didn't want to be with her, i.e. she has another man who's uncomfortable with the biological father being around. There's a lot of reasons for that, but I'm finding more often than not, it's the woman who's keeping the father out. And the black community has yet to deal with that issue. I don't see the church chastising women for keeping the fathers out. I don't see the community leaders chastising women to keep the fathers out. No one wants to address the black woman who's keeping the father away from the child. And then number two, we need women to understand that you have to raise your son. You have to raise him. One of the um, one of the maladaptive issues we see with the single parent mothers sometimes, because they do a great job, and we want to make sure that we commend all the single black mothers out there who do great jobs raising their boys, but we have a lot of women who treat their sons like their husbands. There's no discipline with that boy. There's no direction with that boy. There's no boundaries with that boy. He is symbolically her husband. She depends on her son for her own emotional well-being, and that's not good because when a mother needs the son for her own emotional well-being, then the son actually has control of the mother as opposed to the mother having control of the son. Mm -hmm. The third thing I would say, and this is more so for the men in the community, mm -hmm. we have to engage these boys being raised by their mothers. It is not the mother's job to find a good black man to be a role model to her son. It is the job of the black men in the community to go out and engage these mothers and help them with their boys. My goodness gracious sakes, you're going to hear that and more coming Saturday. This Saturday, Dr. Umar Johnson is coming to Columbus, and he'll be speaking at the First AME Zion uh, Church at 876 Brighton Road. Uh, come on out and be a part of this great, great. Dr. Umar is currently working on building his new school, the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey RBG International Leadership Academy for Boys. Let's take some calls. Dr. Umar, Dr. Umar are you ready for some calls? Yes, sir. All right, let's take some calls. I'm hoping I don't lose you when I hit this. Let's try it. If 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 so, call me right back, okay? No problem. All right, my brother. Ah, that's what I that's what I thought. Okay, call you on the air. But I didn't stabilize. Call you on the air. Go ahead. Yes. Um. So I I want to start out by just saying, if we don't know where we've been, we have nowhere of knowing where we are. Something that um I got from Umar Johnson many years ago. Do you have a do you do you have a do you have a question for him? Do you have a question? Do you have a question for him? No, I don't have a question, but I just want to bring up something. I don't know if he mentioned it. Okay. Um, was about the sex farm. So many times we um have this idea. Well, people have this idea about teaching about slavery, but there's so many things that they left out of the discourse. And one of them was the sex farm. If we want to know why our men are effeminate or what effeminization looks like, we need to go back to where it started and why it started. And one thing that I don't like is that this term effeminate is always linked with uh, uh, feminine men when that's really not what it is. If you think about, when I, when I think about what it means to be a man, I'm thinking about a protector, a provider, a procreator. And when I think about what the feminine men are, they're, they're men who are lacking one or more of those components. And so when I think about men who, um, who, who take women and they call them out their name or they exploit women or um, some one of the examples was like in the videos mm -hmm. when the men make the videos and they have the women and they're just naked and they're just right. those are men who are effeminate. Okay. And so, and so many times when we're looking at these men again in our community who are calling women out their name or who are not protecting them, not standing up for them, those are effeminate men. Effeminate men do not. That does not equate to being. Feminine. Okay, let me get let me get let me get Dr. Umar a chance to respond. Dr. Umar. Yes, sir. I was
would definitely say that there is a distinction between homosexual and effeminate. Effeminate is a behavior, okay, or a pattern of behaviors that represent stereotypical female behavior. Homosexuality is sexual attraction to someone of the same uh, gender. So you can be quite effeminate and not be a homosexual. We all know brothers who are quite effeminate, but to the best of our knowledge, are not gay. And on the flip side, you can be quite masculine. You know, there's certain prisons I've been in where the homosexuals are quite masculine, but yet they are still homosexual. So although most of the time I would say that you tend to find homosexuality and effeminism together and you tend to find masculinity and heterosexuality together, but there are cases where there is the opposite, where someone can be effeminate and still be heterosexual and vice versa, masculine and still be homosexual. So there is a distinction to be drawn there. But I think, you know, in the name of African culture and what manhood is, that we have an obligation to make sure our boys understand that being masculine and being heterosexual are obligations of theirs if they plan to consider themselves men in our society. Now, Dr. Umar, you also do a lot of mental health counseling, psychological kinds, because of your background. Tell us a little bit about that. Most of my work is um, with psychological evaluations of children particularly in a school setting, to determine if they need special education support. So federal law, special ed is a federal law that requires that children be evaluated. They must be psychologically evaluated to determine if they're learning disabled, autistic, emotionally disturbed, uh, intellectually disabled, so forth and so on. And so that's the work that I do. You know, I do thousands, hundreds of evaluations every year. And, you know, one of the things that I want to drive home to parents in Columbus on Saturday is that we have to stop getting our kids evaluated so young. Like, it's absolutely insane that I'm running into situations where the kids are five, six, and seven. I mean, why are you consenting to an ADHD evaluation for a kindergartner? Why are you consenting to a reading disability evaluation for a first grader? If he's in first grade, he just started learning how to read. How about give the little boy a chance before you want to throw him away to special education prison? Okay. All right, Dr. Umar, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're looking forward to you being here. Once again, what time and where at? Yes, sir. First AME Zion Church, 876 Brighton Road, this coming Saturday. So we got six days to go. Doors open up.